So I, I, I'm sorry, uh, first, I apologize for not being present uh, in person, but that was not possible. I hope you will be able to follow my presentation uh, remotely. So I'm asking, a, I believe, an important question um, because, uh, uh, how do I move? I can't move my slides. Ah, I have to do it. Uh, okay. Um, okay, because diversity and complexity are distinctive features of uh, um, biological systems. Um, as you probably know, biological systems are very diverse and complex. And that's true all the way from the constituent molecules of life to the biosphere as a whole. Uh, this diversity and complexity have greatly increased during the evolution of life on Earth. And so I believe a, a very important question is uh, how can such complex systems be stable and persist through time? Another way to phrase the question is to ask the question, do diversity and complexity beget stability? Because that might be part of the answer. And actually, in ecology, there has been a, um, a long debate about this issue. So the first uh, idea that came across uh, uh, through actually all um, publications, textbooks uh, in ecology in the 1950s and 60s is that diversity and complexity do beget stability. And people like Elton, Oden, MacArthur defended this view. But in fact, this idea was based on a, a large list of, uh, I, I, I mentioned a few um, arguments here, but a long list of arguments that are poorly related to one of other, like uh, the fact that species poor islands and human modified ecosystems are very fragile to biological invasions, or the fact that food, complex food webs uh, can be stabilized through alternative energy pathways. So these two arguments have basically nothing in common uh, with one another. So in fact, this idea was not grounded in a solid, uh, consistent theoretical framework. And so in the 1970s, a number of people uh, came, uh, in particular from cybernetics and physics, and that includes the famous uh, Bob May, uh, and came with a completely uh, shift uh, in the idea, and they claim that the opposite is true, in fact. If you assemble large complex systems at random, well, actually, you get a, a, a transition from uh, almost uh, stability with a, a probability one to stability with a probability zero at a, a certain uh, critical threshold, so that uh, the equation, well, the inequality is shown on my slide, such that actually when the system becomes more diverse, more connected, so more complex, actually you become less stable. Now, uh, the problem is that not everybody agreed on, on that, despite the fact that this quickly became the new paradigm. Um, and so there's a big disconnect between theoreticians and, and empiricists uh, still today in ecology, and especially on this stability issue. The way theoreticians see the world is basically, uh, you know, the, this is a kind of cartoon that is taken from a, an ecology textbook where we define stability based on the behavior of a ball rolling on a plane. So that comes directly from physics. And so you can define different stability properties like uh, resilience, resistance. Stability can be local or global. But actually, theoreticians have mostly talked about resilience as it's represented on uh, this uh, cartoon. And it's formally defined uh, using the mathematics of uh, linear uh, systems. Um, linear systems have a very nice property, which is that if you perturb a dynamical system that is uh, nearly linear, in the end, it will converge you know, to equilibrium at a fixed rate, 
which is given by alpha here. And you can see that on a log scale, uh, the slope of the curves are all the same in the end. And technically, this is what we call asymptotic resilience because it's uh, the resilience of the system in the very long run. And it's given by something that mathematicians uh, know probably very well. It's a minus the real part of the dominant eigenvalue of the linearized matrix near equilibrium. Okay, it's very elegant because once you have access to this number, then you can uh, know the stability of the system. The big problem though, uh, that's an example where mathematical beauty <laughs> can be, uh, uh, you know, very attractive to theoreticians, but the problem is that empiricists can't see this in the real world. So this is the way empiricists mostly see the world. They study, for instance, the biomass of the plant population. They see the, the time trends of these uh, time series of these uh, fluctuations, and they typically measure the mean, the variance, and they you know, they so, so measure some variability and they declare that um, the more variable, the less stable the system. Um, and the problem is that theoreticians and empiricists have largely continued to study different components of stability uh, until recently. And I'm sorry, um, you maybe you see my, um, my um, mouse here. You see, I will only focus on the first uh, two uh, columns here. You see that among the components of stability that have been used in studies, you see that variability is the one that is used in experimental and empirical studies. And in contrast, you see that the big red column here is uh, theory. And so you see that there's a big, big, uh, a big disconnect between the two. So uh, just a few technical uh, things before uh, moving on. Uh, I want to uh, say a few words about how uh, variability or its inverse in variability can be measured. So as you surely know, the variance typically scales as the square of the mean. And this means that if you compare very different systems, uh, you, most of the time it's useful to uh, measure variability with the coefficient of variation or its square, uh, because it removes the effect of the mean. Not completely, but uh, at least it, uh, it's uh, better that way. And then you can define invariability, which is the inverse of variability, which is a kind of measure of stability through time as the inverse of the matrix, okay? So now uh, I would just like to, to show you a few results from uh, real data uh, from uh, large scale biodiversity experiments. So this is one of these experiments where the number of species has been manipulated experimentally across a large uh, uh, number of plots. Here there are more than uh, 300 plots, each 100 uh, 69 square meters. So this is a huge uh, area. This is another project, Biodex, which was which did the same across the whole of Europe with several hundred uh, plots. And so basically, one of the, the the main results from these experiments, which is now well known in the, in the literature, is that species diversity tends to increase the biomass production of plants in these grasslands. This is not the, 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 the important thing that I want to discuss it. This is the best known result, but more recently we started to look at the temporal uh, time series of these uh, of the uh, biomass, plant biomass. And what we found is that uh, very often you get also um, a decreasing variability, so this is the coefficient of variation of total biomass in the plots. So that decreases with species richness in both experiments. Now the problem is that this seems to contradict classical, the, well, the famous new paradigm, the, the theory um, built by Bob May and others. And so this raises the question whether actually we have 
define stability in the right way, whether mathematical beauty uh, alone is enough. And in fact, if you look at it, you can see that there's a big problem because um, clearly we need a theory that of ecological stability that first integrates the various stability components and second has a stronger link to empirical study. So I, I've, plot, I've plotted here a kind of typical uh, time series where you have a perturbation. So you have, let's say, plant biomass that fluctuates uh, around a, some kind of equilibrium. Then suddenly you have a big perturbation and then you return to the equilibrium uh, in the long run. So you can measure different things here, different components of stability. You can define um, re uh, resistance, uh, which is how much the system will uh, change after the perturbation. So here, resistance is high, here it's low. Then you can have uh, resilience as the, the rate at which you return to equilibrium. Here it's slow because it's, you, you see that it takes a lot of time to return to equilibrium. Here it's high. You can measure invariability as I defined it already. You can also measure persistence. Uh, persistence describes the fact that when you have low persistence, you shift to a kind of alternative stable state, for instance. And the problem is that we don't have a, the, the classical theory doesn't account for all of this. And in fact, even worse than that, we have shown recently that asymptotic resilience is not even a good predictor of finite time resilience, which can be observed uh, here on this graph. It's actually only, it works only in such a long time that it's uh, actually, and for small, such small perturbations that actually you can't observe that in real time series. So we have a problem. We have a theory that actually is based on a nice uh, measure, but actually it's not practical at all. We also need a theory that spans multiple scales and levels of organization. And for instance, I showed you already the decline of variability um, as species richness increases in the biodiversity experiment. If you disaggregate um, total biomass into its components, let's say at the species level, you see that the opposite of pattern holds. At the species level, uh, stability decreases, so variability increases, while at the total system level, it's the opposite. So basically, we can say in this particular case that the whole is the sum of its parts because total biomass is really the sum of the biomass of the various species, but nevertheless, it obeys different rules. So why is that the case? Um, there is a theory that is called biological insurance theory that has addressed this issue. Basically to first introduce you to the theory in a simple uh, intuitive way. This theory predicts uh, that aggregate uh, ecosystem properties vary less in more diverse communities because declines in the performance or abundance of some species or phenotypes is offset by smooth declines or increases in others. This theory is relatively recent, especially mathematically, but it has old roots in economics with portfolio theory, cybernetics, and also ecology. Um, so basically what uh, this theory has shown is that the main factor, the main mechanism that generates this differentiation at the uh, population and total uh, system level is the level of asynchrony of the way species respond to environmental variation. You can see that here because another factor that was proposed in literature is competition. But as you see, uh, so here you have a, a mathematical model that I will present later. Um, where you have um, you have two populations, a red and blue, that fluctuates through time, and then you have total biomass here. This is on a log scale. You see that competition, whether it, there's no competition or strong competition, doesn't affect total biomass. In fact, 
it does affect uh, population uh, stability, but not uh, the stability of total biomass. And it's the level of asynchrony that really governs the stabilization of total biomass. So this theory can be made uh, mathematical. Uh, and so in particular, we developed uh, a number of approaches to that, but this is an example with a discrete time multi-species stochastic lot cover for our competition model. So basically a lot of plant species compete with each other. And there's an element of stochasticity. So you have the per capita population growth rate, which is determined by three factors. First, intra and interspecific competition among species. That's a typical loss cover to our uh, formalism. And then you have environmental stochasticity and demographic stochasticity. So these terms are a bit uh, barbaric, but uh, uh, they are classical terms in the ecological literature. This means the impact of the environment on the growth rate of each species. And this is the impact of random variations among individuals within a population. And based on this um, uh, kind of uh, mathematical model, you can actually derive some predictions about uh, how the variability of total biomass uh, will be um, around in, in the vicinity of the equilibrium. And it's actually determined by, uh, driven by three different factors, environmental stochasticity, demographic stochasticity, and you should add observation error in, with real data. And so that leads to three mechanisms through which um, um, that can lead to an effect of diversity on um, the variability of total biomass. Only the first one is really compatible with the classical biological insurance theory. The other ones are really uh, stochastic terms that have little to do with uh, biological insurance as such. When we apply this, um, the nice thing is that this can be applied directly to uh, data in, on plant biodiversity experiments. When we did that, what we found is that actually, uh, so we had only four long-term experiments where our theory, uh, our prediction could be applied. We found that asynchrony of species environmental response was actually significant in only one of these experiments, whereas the two stochastic terms were present every time they were measured. Um, so this is not a general result because in, in other experiments since then, um, we found that uh, biological insurance does occur, but it shows the importance of purely uh, stochastic factors that have been completely ignored in ecology uh, so far. And that, and actually it makes sense why they are so important in these experiments is that the plots are seem, seem large at, at first sight, but at the level of each species, actually they are relatively few individuals. And so the, there's a big role of stochastic variations in these uh, experiments. One of the nice uh, things where uh, mathematics mathematics start to reveal its uh, real beauty is that uh, this whole theory can be scaled up across many scales. And this is an example where we propose a way to scale up the approach from the level of the variability of each population. They can be aggregated into communities locally. And then these communities can be aggregated into what is called a meta community at the regional scale. So it's, it's basically the ensemble of the various communities. So you can scale up in two different ways, either from population to community and community to meta community, or from population to a meta population, and then aggregate across species at this, at this level. The nice thing is that the aggregation is performed, actually uh, the variability at one level is equal to the variability at the other level, and, and there's only a, a, a multiplication by a factor that is called synchrony. So we have different kinds of synchrony. And then the nice thing is that if you apply this, uh, this approach, then you can start looking at the 
how the different forms of asynchrony contribute to stability at different scales. And we apply that, for instance, uh, to some desert plant uh, meta communities. And you have the, the two ways of aggregating things. So basically, this is the population level. This is the meta population level, and, and that's the meta community level. And uh, the two ways of aggregating, of course, have the same starting points and the same end, end points. Uh, it's only the, the, um, the kind of synchrony that, um, that um, differs be between the two. But now we can look at the factors that affect variability, synchrony, etc. And for instance, in this particular case, we could show that local species richness affects uh, local variability in such a way that it's stabilizing, so variability decreases, and it's mostly through local uh, species synchrony. The same occurs at the regional scale. So that's just an example to show that the theory uh, works and it's useful. We, we've also devised a new approach a continuous approach through the invariability area relationship where we can predict in models how by increasing just the area studied, uh, the level of stability observed, so this, this is the invariability as defined previously, should increase either uh, in a three-stage process like here or uh, in a more gradual um, uh, asymptotic way here. And we could apply that to empirical data. And indeed, for instance, global prim primary productivity does follow the, you know, the kind of theoretical predictions. And here, Burbine must follows rather the, the other model. So a few conclusions. Um, I didn't have the time to prove that to you, but uh, uh, a big conclusion, I think that is that classical ecological theory, which uses asymptotic resilience, has been largely diverse from empirical data. Invariability is a much more relevant measure of stability, in my opinion. And by focusing on inv invariability, biological insurance theory has been able to provide a completely new perspective on this old debate on the relationship between diversity and stability. In particular, it predicts different diversity stability relationships at the population and ecosystem levels, and that agrees very much with empirical data. This theory also provides a consistent framework for stu studying stability across scales. Uh, overall, there's now strong evidence that biodiversity helps maintain the stable functioning of biological systems in the face of external perturbations. And perhaps a more speculative conclusion is that if that's the case, then we might imagine that natural selection has favored an increase in the, in the diversity and complexity of life. Uh, and that could explain previously and explain my macro evolutionary uh, trends. Uh, so that's a more speculative, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting um, possibility. And I thank you for your attention.